Shabbat Shalom everyone. My name is Dottie Usual Abel and I like to serve you forever as the priest is starting very soon. It's now time to start finding your seats for Sabbath services. Shabbat Shalom everyone. My name is Daughter of Yisrael ha- Abel Falling Hawkins and I would like to present to you the sons and daughters of Yisrael Abel now entering the sanctuary. Shabbat Shalom everyone. My name is Daughter of Israel Abel, Shemaria. Today's theme is Be Ready for, great, for the Great Passover. Prepare to come to the great city of Israel. I am excited about this feast. Are you? It is my honor and privilege to introduce the first two speakers. Please stand and give them a warm welcome. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Please be seated. The PCI will be with each and every one of you. My topic will be, be ready for the great feast of Passover and eleven bread. Prepare to come to the great city of Israel. I'll be starting on a scripture which is Matthew 5, 14-16, saying, You are the light of the world, a city which is set on a hill, cannot be hidden, neither do... Men, light a lamp and hide it under a basket, but put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, so they might see our one righteous works, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The city of Israel shines light by all our righteousness. What is our righteousness? The keeping of Yahweh's laws. When we keep Yahweh's laws, we get the eleven hour of life. So looking forward to Yeshua's memorial, Passover, and the Feast of Eleven Bread, we continue to prepare for this feast and our diligence in keeping all Yahweh's 613 laws, removing all sin and consuming, partaking, becoming unleavened like Yeshua and Yahweh. Getting the eleven hour of lives means to think of others with love, just as Yeshua did spoken in the scriptures. Now this... Let's turn to Yaakonan 13, verses 35. Yaakonan 13, verses 35. Say, by this all will know you are my disciples, by the love you have for one another. Now please turn to Yaakonan 14, verse 15. Saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. We have about 21 weeks and two, day, two days until we celebrate this Great Feast of Passover and Eleven Bread and this prophesied time period called the end, the three, last three and a half years. This feast is going to be a feast to be remembered and one you don't want to miss. Hurry, what are you waiting for? Get here, we're waiting for you. But Yahweh bless you, stand for the next speaker. Mm. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You can be seated. The title of my speech is Obedience to the One Set Will Save Your Life. So the theme for today's presentation is Be Ready for the Great Passover, Prepare to Come to the Great City of Yosha. The first Passover took place in the land of Egypt during the time when Moshe was the one set. The only ones that were saved were those who made the choice to be obedient to the instructions that they were given. During that time, those who were obedient to Yahweh's voice were spared, and later they came out of Egypt with Moshe guiding them towards the house of Yahweh to learn Yahweh's word. Yahweh tells us that there will be a second Passover in these last days. Yahweh's people will again be tested on their obedience to the one set. Your very life depends on this obedience. In Isaiah 2.2 and Micaiah 4.1, it talks about many people who will flow to the city of Israel to learn the character of Yahweh through the laws of Yahweh. We are hurriedly preparing for your arrival at the city of Yeshua. Now it's up to you to start preparing to come to, the, to come to Yahweh's feast of Passover. 
We only have five short months left until the great feast of Passover. Satan will throw every excuse and problem at you from a, to stop you from attending this feast. Your determination and effort must be greater than any excuse or problem that comes your way. Your very life depends on your obedience and keeping this law. The road might be rough, the journey might be long, but Yahweh will be with you in every mile of the way. In the third book of Yeshua, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, You will call me, and I will answer you. You will be with, I will be with you in trouble. He was in the days of Moshe, and he will be again. He says, he will, I will deliver you and honor you. We look forward to seeing you at the feast, and with that, I would like to turn it over to the next speaker. If you all remain standing at this time, it's a privilege and honor to turn it over to the Holy Women of New, the Queens of the House of Yahweh. Shabbat Shalom, great saints of Yahweh. Please sit. Let the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of us who are here today. To all those who are joining us over all different forms of media. And also those who hunger and thirst after Yahweh's righteousness. Also, we want to give a nice warm welcome to our wonderful body of women of new who will be speaking on the topic theme of the speeches. Be ready for the great Passover. Prepare to come to the great city of Israel. Be ready. How was your feast? Nice. So question number one, I'm going to test you. Are you ready? Did you study? Nice. What's this? Wonderful. Now it's not hard, so let's go right away. Um, what is the number that has four digits? Very dear to Yahweh's last work. We study that number a lot for the feast. Shout your answer if you know what it is. Are they correct? Let's see. Yes. Lovely. Number two. What is the fabric? That's why it's for the children. <laughs> oh, dear. It has a frequency of 5,000. We used it on the first grade day. And on the last grade day, we're trying to see if it's going to help us get in contact with Yahweh. What's the answer? Shout it if you know it. Amen. Are you correct? Nice. Now, what is the phrase that covered all the speeches in the feast? And also the theme of the feast. What is the phrase? I'm going to show you the first letters. And I'm giving you a few seconds to, answer, to think it and then answer. Think you got it? All righty, shout your answer. I'm hearing it. Very nice. Can we turn to show us our answer, please? Did you think that? Very nice. Okay, so wonderful. Very nice. That's all for the test. Now, our theme for the feast of today's Sabbath is still based on getting ready with your righteousness intact and getting ready for our last great days. And with this, we turn over to our great first speaker. Praise Yahweh. Shalom, everyone. Please be seated. So the title of my speech today is, What Are You Ready For? Turn over to Colossians 2, verse 16 and 17. Colossians 2, verse 16 and 17. 
Therefore, let no man condemn you for doing these things, eating and drinking in the observance of a feast day, or of a new moon, or of the Sabbath day, which are a shadow from things to come for the body of Messiah. So keep, by keeping and doing these things, we will be protected. So pastor has been harping on this Passover, or the great Passover, and repeating, be here, be here at the city of Israel. You have to be here physically, not just physically, but mentally and spiritually, and be grounded. You can't be thinking in your head, well, yeah, I live here, so, you know, pastor, he's not talking to me. Well, of course he's talking to you. He's talking to everyone in the house of Yahweh, every single member in the house of Yahweh. Because you could be here physically, but if you're not strictly keeping the laws 100%, and following every instruction and working on overcoming and on your puffed up with pride attitude, you're not here. You could be all the way in Egypt. We must also be careful not to fall back into sin. Watch yourself daily. Watch your every interaction, your everything you say, everything you do, and be on guard. Reflect on your day, making sure you don't fall back into sin. Don't look at other people's shortcomings and think, well, if they can get away with it, then so can I. It's just a little thing. Like you see Missy over there and she's eating her shark. Well, probably not shark, but she's playing on her phone in services. And you think, well, if she can do it, then I can do it. No, don't follow the crowd in doing evil. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts righteous character." You're following her, playing on your phone while life-saving information is being brought, and you're all the way in Egypt, not hearing when the tree drops. Let it be known that Yahweh is in full control of everything. Every speaker that gets up and speaks, he wants him to speak because there's something that he knows that we need at that time. These are just a few ways for us to get ready for this great Passover, or the great Passover. So right before every Passover, we read 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6 through 8. And that talks about purging out the old leaven. We know this is a continuous process. It's not something we just do for Passover. But you know what? Let's start getting rid of every tiny bit of sin from our lives right now. We have five or six months till Passover, so let's start working really hard to sweep our houses clean. Get all tiny bit of sin out of our lives. And get ourselves to the great city of Israel, mentally, physically, and spiritually, and be ready for the great Passover. Pastor said it can be this Passover or it can be the second Passover. That is why we need to get ready, be ready, and stay ready. So I ask again, what are you ready for? How are you preparing yourself? Remember, this is no joke. This is a life or death situation. Are you watching yourself? Am I watching myself? Or are we worrying about what our sister next to us is doing and what her shortcomings might be? I pray that we're not doing these things. We don't have time for that. We don't have time for that nonsense. We need to be paying attention to ourselves. Time is short. Well, actually, there is no time. There's no time to be going back into sin, going back into the world, going back into worldly things, because there is no hope in the world. There is no hope in sin. By sinning or sinning willfully, it's like we're taking our lives, crumbling it up, and throwing it into a trash can. We've worked way too hard to be going back now. We should never want to turn away, not now, not ever. This is very serious. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2 and 3. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2 and 3. For you yourself know perfectly that the day of Yahweh so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace, true peace, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. We will know, but we must watch, stay awake, and study. And be here mentally, not just physically, but also spiritually. We must and we need to be ready and prepared. Turn over to Revelation 16, verse 15. Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. Keeps his garments, his linen garments. Continuing on in that verse. Or he will run naked and they will know his shame. So I ask again, what are you ready for? So remember, watch, study, and don't ever let go. Don't 
ever let go of your linen garment, because that is the righteousness of the saints. And with this, I'd like to turn it over to the next speaker. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You all can be seated. My title today is Learning to be Humble. So please turn over to Revelations 19, verse 8. That's Revelations 19, verse 8, found on page 983. And it reads, And to them was granted that they should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So a few weeks ago, I was reading the sermon, and Pastor, he was saying how linen is nothing but humility, and in order to wear our linen, we have to be humble, or it won't fulfill its purpose. And in the first book of Israel, chapter 23, verse 16, Pastor says, Yahweh told you to humble yourself to the teacher he puts over you. He says, I'm not trying to build myself up. I have never been guilty of doing such a thing. Yahweh will build you up if you do, if you do what he says. He will guide you. If you do not humble yourself and hang on to this pride, you are not going to be in my house. Just as Yeshua said, you are not of my household. I never knew you. You just don't fit in with the rest of the family. So I hear Pastor saying when you're not humble, you separate yourself from the family. And he's also saying that you won't make it if you're not humble or if you don't humble yourself. So in order to be fit to wear this linen, we have to be humble. So now let's break this down into some little parts so we can get a better understanding of this. The definition of humble for Merriam-Webster's dictionary is not proud or arrogant, not thinking of yourself as better than anyone else. Now one of the greatest examples of someone being humble is Yahshua. And if you turn over to Philippians 2, verse 5 through 8, that's Philippians 2, verse 5 through 8, it reads, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Yahshua Messiah, who, being in the form of Yahweh, did not think it was something to be seized upon, to be equal with Yahweh, but abased himself, taking the form of a servant, made like men, being born, and being found in fashion, appearance, and conduct. Like a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, the death of the sacrifice on the stake. So as you see, Yahshua lowered himself. He was humble. Remember, not proud or arrogant, not thinking of yourself as better than anyone else. So he humbled himself and served others. And this isn't the only scripture that talks about Yahshua being humble. Another example is if you turn over to Yachanan 13, verse 4 through 5, that's Yachanan 13, verse 4 through 5, and it reads, He got up from supper and laid aside his tally. Then he took a towel and tied it around himself. After that, he poured water into a basin, then began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that he had tied around himself. You see, Yahshua was a servant. He humbled himself and served his disciples by washing their feet. Yahshua had the attitude of servitude, and that's what we must have. Here are some more examples of how Yahshua served. You know, he healed the sick, he fed the multitudes, he clothed the naked, and he was also teaching. And then you also had that time when um, him and his disciples, they were picking wheat, and the Pharisees that came up to him, and they were like, you know, you shouldn't be doing these things on the Sabbath, it's like breaking a law or whatever. And they, Yahshua was like, no, he was serving others, and he actually taught them that it was okay to do these things on the Sabbath as long as you're serving others. Yahshua dedicated his whole entire life to serving others. And any time you probably write about Yahshua, he was always doing something to serve. He was always teaching or feeding others, doing what he had to do to serve. So yes, Yahshua humbled himself and served others. And those are just a few of the many things Yahshua did to serve. Because remember, in order for you to serve others, you have to humble yourself first. And as you see, Yahshua is the most... Yahshua is the most perfect example of how we must be in these last days and throughout all of eternity. Yahshua humbled himself enough that he died on the stake for us so we could have an opportunity in these last days. Do you realize that if Yahshua wasn't that humble, we would not have the kingdom or anything to look forward to? All of the blessings that we have been promised, we wouldn't have any of that to look forward to. If Yahshua hadn't died on the stake, he died on the stake for each and every one of our sins. We need to humble ourselves just as Yahshua did, because Yahweh resists the proud. He doesn't accept it. He resists it. In the second book of Israel, chapter 6, verse 105, Pastor says, It is probably the hardest lesson to learn, because Satan did not have humility. She wanted to rise above Yahweh. She sought self-glory. And this is the reason that we must get it out of ourselves. Yahweh simply will not allow it into his kingdom or into this new world. So Satan was prideful, and that is how she turned herself to a, into a god. So it's as simple as not humbling yourself and hanging on to this pride that makes you a god. 
Remember, Yahweh resists the proud. He doesn't accept that. I want you all to remember that. Yahweh resists the proud. So as Pastor said, humbling yourself is one of the hardest things that we will ever have to do. But we can do it. Yahweh says we can. In closing, please turn over to First Kepha 5 verse 5. That's First Kepha 5 verse 5. And it reads, In the same way, you younger, submit yourselves to those who are elders. Yes, all of you, be subject one to the other, and be clothed with humility. For Yahweh resists the power, but gives mercy to the humble. So just remember, Yahweh resists the power, but gives mercy to the humble. And with this, I'll turn over to the next speaker. Shalom, you may be seated. You can be seated. And I just want to say surprise to my sons. Yes, now you have to pay attention. The title of my speech today is Paying Attention to Myself and to the Doctrines. This brings great things to my health. The kingdom's knocking. Um, if you would like to turn over to 1 Timothy or 1 Timothy 4, I'll be reading uh, verse 11 through 16. And I'm just sharing with you some of the things that I've been learning this past few weeks. It says, command and teach these things. Let no man despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word and conduct in love and spirit and faith and purity. Give attention to the reading, exhortation to the teachings, and don't neglect the gift that's in you. I'm paraphrasing because I really love the scripture. So, um, Set your love upon these things. Give yourself completely to them that your progress can be evident, will be evident to all. Pay attention to yourself or to the doctrines, continue in them. For in doing this, you will say both yourself and those who hear you. When it says not to let people despise your youth, it's talking about, to me, I think of when I'm young, because I'm still very young, a lot younger than my teachers, don't do anything that will make them frustrated at the fact that you're young. <laughs> Let no man despise your youth. Use this time wisely. And especially when you're a teenager, just if you're spiritually minded, think about this. The scripture is telling you just because you're a teenager, it doesn't give you an excuse to be stupid. <laughs> okay. And then it's also, we have to think on these things. Like Philippians says, think on these things. Think about our teachers and their examples and follow them. If you have a problem with something, be the change that you want to see. So now let's go to Matthew 23, verse 3. I'm going to be turning with you so that I don't, I'm not too fast. Okay, Matthew 23, verse 3. It says, Therefore, obey and practice everything they tell you to observe, but do not imitate their works, for they preach, but they do not practice. In the days of Yeshua, they were dealing with Pharisees. Here in the house of Yahweh, we're dealing with people who are trying to come to perfection too, who in our eyes are perfect. So how much more should we obey and practice everything taught and not be so focused on what other people are doing wrong? But, and now I'm going to just go down to verse 6. It says, they love the, oh wait, verse 5 and 6. But all the works they do are to be practiced to be seen by men. They widen their phylacteries and lengthen their seats on their talits. They love the best places at the feast, the front seats. It says, don't be called rulers, but he who is greatest among you will be your servant. And this is what we see in our authorities today. And it's a wonderful thing that we want to be. Whoever will exalt himself will be abased, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And it's not about what other people see. It's about what you're doing on the inside. And at the end, people will see. So I was talk somebody was talking to me and they said this, said something, and I was texting him back, and I put it in Gematria, and I was shocked. <laughs> if you can show that. <laughs> I think you are saying two change can't be seen till it manifests itself within, from within the person. That's why Yeshua said, first clean the inside of the cup. It's not about what others see. 1074.6 was the number, is the number it comes out to in Gematria. Well, the way I think about it is we are number six, 
And the way we get to 1074 is by paying attention to ourselves. Okay, so Yahshua even told his disciples, despite the fact that they were surrounded by hypocrites, Yeshua was still teaching them and telling them to focus on themselves. So how much more should we do this? When we are surrounded by the most righteous people who want nothing more than to see us succeed. So Sino G5 says, Yeshua does not forbid giving just honor, but condemns selfish ambition and seeking superiority over the brothers. So it's not wrong to recognize change, but it's wrong to change to be recognized. So verse 26, it says, You blind Pharisees, first cleanse the inside of the cup and plate so that the outside can be clean also. For they tie, And then I'm going to go to verse 4. For they tie up heavy burdens hard to be carried and lay them on men's shoulders. But you yourselves will not lift up of one finger to move it. Now, what are these heavy burdens? Isaiah tells us, Isaiah 58, verse 9. It says, Then they will call, and Yahweh will answer. You will cry, and you will say, Here I am. If you, turn, if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, the speaking vanity, this is the heavy burden that we place on each other. And we don't want to be hypocrites. And I feel so sorry that I have any part of that. But it is our carnal nature. And as the scripture says, there's no temptation taking hold of you except what's common to men. We all got these issues, and we all have to overcome them. So Romans 14, 4 says, Who are you to condemn someone else's servant? To his own ruler he stands or falls, and he will surely stand, for Yahweh is able to make him stand. Despite what we think, each of us are going to stand. Praise Yahweh. And Psalms 19 verse 7 tells us why. The laws are perfect. It's not us. It's not our own wonderful awesomeness. The laws of Yahweh are perfect, converting the whole person, making the simple ones wise. Okay. So this is what we have to look forward to. Talking about fasting, Yahshua says, um, I mean, Isaiah, it says, It is not the kind of fast that I've chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. It is not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor. Share your bread with the hungry. Be willing to share what you understand with others. Be willing to share what a pastor teaches us with others when they want to know it. Be willing to give it to them. It says, bring into your house the poor, and when you see the naked that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Like, I don't do that. Okay? Don't, we all do it. (laughs) We all have to overcome. None of us is better than the other. So, to get from 6 to 1074, remember that we must focus on ourselves, and Yahweh promises that when we do this, he will bring us our rewards and our verification or whatever you want to call it. With that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. You may be seated. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, Grace Saints of Yahweh. It is an honor to be speaking with you today. The title of my uh, speech is Yahweh's Branch of Yisraelogy. Spoken by a Yisraelogist. So how many people will question, how many people have ever been scared to death? Raise your hand. Well, I can say that's not a true statement because we're still here. But what I would like to talk about today is this great city, this great city of Israel spoken of since the beginning that was going to bring forth life, life as we know it. It is an awesome thing because Yahweh is preparing his people to come out of this world of sickness, death, and disease. But he started with a plan, as we know in Genesis 126, and also Psalms 8, Yachanan 1, 1 through 5, that he had a plan since the beginning 
that he will call his second Abel, his second Noah, to warn us, to warn our brothers and sisters out there. The time is at hand. The warning is given out. I just want to go back because this is very serious. When I was living, before I lived in New York, I was living in Chicago and didn't know, because I, I was born in Chicago and I was to move to New York. I didn't want to go there. I did everything to stay in Chicago. So I finally went there. Didn't know the plan of Yahweh. I didn't even know Yahweh. So what occurred is that I did go, and Yahweh called me from the belly of the beast. But before he called me from the belly of the beast, I was working as a temp at the World Trade. And when they first tried to bomb it at the bottom when they had the parking lots, I was like, something's up. They're not finished. Something else is going to occur. They're not finished. with Whatever they did, they're not finished. I was praying, but I didn't pray to Yahweh. So when Yahweh called me out, the sisters and brothers in the house, they worked at the World Trade, Five World Trade. We saw people come in and out every day. I still pray, Yahweh, please, I don't want to be here. Something's going to occur. I don't know what is going to occur. Yahweh saved me again. Yahweh allowed me to work with my head. And so that day that it occurred, it was chaos. I mean, utter chaos in the city. If you, in, if you live in New York, the bridge is shut down, you are locked in. You cannot get out. That's how serious it is because a warning is going out to our people. We have to come home. We have to come home to be taught by this Yisraelist, Yisrael Hawkins, to teach us the Yisraelogy that Yahweh assigned him to do. Again, I was saved. I felt like the priests that were in Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, I was working in a store. 2003, it was a blackout in five different states. My husband said he was coming to get me. I didn't walk back across Brooklyn, uh, the bridge to go to back to Brooklyn. I stayed there. If you would have seen that night, all the crazy people running around like it was one big party. I'm calling the Kohana. The only thing that was working was the, the, the pay phones. I'm calling. It's like, please, I'm stuck here. I'm waiting for my husband. Yahweh sent two women to pull me off that street that night and take me into their house. That's Yahweh's mercy, okay? Yahweh's mercy is going throughout this world, gathering his people to come to him. Pastor, is he wants us to come home for a reason. Because remember, we're coming to prepare for Passover. What does that mean? That means to renew the covenant. The blood of Yahshua is that blood that will go on that doorpost. We have to be serious here and abroad. I wasn't warned. I knew something was going to take place, but y'all always giving you the warning. You don't know what would take place at that time and point. You have to get here. I am inspiring you. I am trying to stir you to action. Whatever you have, Israel Hawkins is going to provide it for you. What he's trying to provide right now, he's trying to provide each and every one of us a place to be part of that priesthood, to make us ready. Can you show me the first one, please? I got the, uh, the first man-made computer right here. Okay. So, Yisrology. So, we go to the Greek, 1127. It means to keep awake. Is Yisrael Hawkins keeping us awake? To watch, to be vigilant. 1453, to rouse from sleep, from sitting or lying, from disease, from death. Obscurity. What does that mean in dictionary.com? From darkness, from confusion, from ignorance, from being evil like the gods. That is what Yisrael Hawkins is teaching us. That's the branch that Yahweh wants us to learn, the Yisraelogy branch, okay? Let's go to the next one. And what is a Yisraelist? So we go to the Jew, Jewish 64. Hebrew. It says metal of vineyards, right? We have Yahweh 
The vine dresses the vine. Okay, so the family, servant, 1121, a son, a builder of the family, builder to repair. Let me just say this. We all are a family of Yahweh. Yisrael Hawkins is our lifeline. We have nothing else. We have that great man. If we don't know who he is, it's nothing out there but death. It's nothing out there. We have to renew the covenant. We have to be prepared. He is going to make us perfect to be presented. As the Kahan said, you have to be present to be presented. If you're not present, you ain't going to be presented. You're not going to be presented. So we have to do everything that Israel says. I don't have any more time, but praise Yahweh. And thank you for it. It's an honor to be able to teach. Praise you. I'll turn on to the next speaker. Shalom, everyone. You can be seated. My title is Yahweh is Our Lifeline. I'd like to start off with reading a quote from the Mark of the Beast. In chapter 11, verse 15 and 19, it says, Yahweh shows us if we remain in contact with him by obeying him. In the first chapter of this book, we have proven from scripture of the Mark of Yahweh, on us is his Sabbath and his feast days. If we observe the Sabbath of Yahweh, and if we can keep Yahweh's feast, then we will have that mark of Yahweh, and we will be protected by him. When we keep Yahweh's holy days, we are set apart as belonging to him, to be called his, to be stamped with that mark. This is a privilege in itself that we are here. You, me, we are called out of all the the 8 billion people in the world, that we are here to sit at the feet of that man. We didn't get this position because we have a nice car, a nice home, we won a trophy, we ran a 5K, any of that. We're not here because of those things. We're not here because of money. We're here because Yahweh picked us, the worst of the worst, to prove his laws can be fulfilled. And us as a body can come into unity with this administration. That is a privilege. If I can have you turn over to Yekexia 20, verse 19. It says, I am Yahweh, your father. Walk in my statutes and my judgments and do them. He didn't give us the choice. He told us to do them and hollow my Sabbaths and they will be a sign between me and you. And you will know that I am your father. Yahweh knows who his children are, but he's giving us the opportunity and wants to know that we will put our full trust in him. For him to be our father. He is our life. We're the only ones who break that line. We're the only ones who can separate ourselves from him. When we sin, we have turned our back on him. He never would ever turn his back on us. We do it to ourselves. Remember, if we do not obey Yahweh, we come into the obedience of Satan. If I can have you turn over to 1 Corinthians 10, 20. It says, you cannot drink the cup of Yahweh and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of Yahweh's table and the table of demons. You cannot partake of the table of Yahweh and the table of demons and be a part of his family. Sin deteriorates our bodies instantly. The first sign of sin, our bodies die internally. I have a quote from the book of Israel. The first book of Israel, chapter 20, verse 83. He says, showing love. He shows love to everyone, even those who are going to perish. But showing love to thousands who love me by keeping my laws. You shall not take the name of Yahweh, your heavenly father, and bring it to nothing. 
That is saying that you are carrying the name and that you're going to keep his laws and belonging to his house. And then you're going to turn back to sin by going out in the, into the world and living a different life with which, which you live here. Remember the Sabbath day. A lot of people forget this after they've been in the house for a while. They start, getting ne- they start to neglect and start doing things on the Sabbath and breaking the Sabbath in many ways. What are we doing in our daily lives? Not just the Sabbath, but our, even our daily lives. The laws of Yahweh cover every aspect of our lives. Our home, our kitchens, our living rooms, our dining tables, our bedrooms, our work area, supervisors, co-workers, every aspect of our lives, even within ourselves, our thoughts, what we say. We have come this far. Why go back now? We're almost there. I have an article from Fox News. It was a it was a very tragic incident with a family that took place this last week. Can I get my image shown? This is a charred skeleton of an SUV. A windshield pierced with bullet holes. A blood-stained car seat. How are new images from the northern Mexico where nine Americans killed by cartel gunmen have been released? Three women and six children, all under the age of 12, have lost their lives and were several injured in this week's massacre. The bloodshed occurred in Sonoa State where the suspect cartel gunmen ambushed the families. The three convoys SUV pictured from the scene showed a vehicle with dozens of bullet holes. It was burnt out from a fire after a bullet hole was hit by the gas tank and exploded. These children burned to death. Now, I don't want to scare you to come to the feast because that's what this is all about. So yes, come to the feast. We invite you to the city of Israel. This was just a family who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. They don't have Yahweh's protection like we do. These are things we're going to see. We can't take our position for granted. Because we do. When we do, we've lost it all. So I hope you are preparing for the feast, and we will see you soon. And with that, I would like to turn it over to the next speaker. Shabbat shalom, everyone. You can be seated. The title of my speech today is Only Men Can Change. Only men can change mankind. If you'll turn to page 491 in your books of Yahweh. It's Psalms 131, verse 14. It says, We praise you, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, as we know very well. A reading from the second book of Israel. Going on to perfection. Page 19, Pastor says, Yahweh planned this long before he created mankind, before anything was made. He had this made out. He had his plan met, his, he had his plan out to create a fleshly human being in a manner where he could build character, think, come to decision, and set his mind upon those decisions firmly. So notice those four things, that man can has the ability to create character, to think, to come to decisions, and then to set his mind firmly or her mind firmly on those decisions. Continuing, it says, Yahweh created you in a special way. 
I have also brought out that Yahweh put different environments in front of each one of us. So Yahweh put different environments in front of us, as you, can, you heard from the other speakers, what Yahweh, um, the environment that they were in, but that was not it. Because here it says that Yahweh, he sent his malachim to protect us and, from the harm and danger until he got us to his house where he could train us to come to perfection. And you've heard from the other speaker of the experiences that they went through and how they got to the house of Yahweh. And they are here. Praise Yahweh. So we see that um, this ability that Yahweh has given us, it's not a small thing. And it's only mankind who has this ability because Hebrews chapter 2 verse 7, it says that we are created lower than the Malachim. And Pastor explains here that he created you in, a, in such a way he didn't create the Malachim in this way, brethren. There's nothing in, in all the scriptures that says he created Malachim so that they can do what you can do in the fleshly body. So they cannot do what we're able to do. And remember those four things. The ability to build character, the ability to think, come to decisions, and then set your mind in, the, in those decisions firmly. So it, Pastor says he had, he had to create you lower than the Malachim in order to build character in you, in order that you would suffer from the wickedness or sin. When the Malachim turned to sin, I don't see any possible way in Scripture that there is any turning back for them. I don't see them where, where they can build character to where they can decide against these things and overcome it. Like we can. So they, they don't have that ability. Only human beings have. And you can ask yourself, what about the animals and the bees, the birds? And, but the scripture says in Jacob 3.7, it's on page 954. Jacob chapter 3 verse 7 says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creatures can be tamed, and has been tamed by mankind. And Pastor explains in the second book of Israel, page 11, um, he reads Jacob 3 7, For every kind of beast and birds and reptiles and sea creatures can be tamed. That is, we can put them in cages or rob them. My dad used to break the meanest house in the country, but there, there was one that he couldn't break. And then he explains, um, it, used, it used to go to sleep when you put the saddle on it. Every animal, can, even the wild beast, can be trained in a, to a certain extent. You can train them to a certain extent. I have told you about Charlie Heap, a man in, the country, in my country hometown who I used to love to go see. I loved to, to see him train these animals. He had a trainer come from California to train them for shows. They were all trained in Graham, Texas, where I spent a number of years. I used to enjoy going there. I had, he had a lion he called Blondie that stayed in his house. Blondie had several people. See, you, you could train them, but they could change, you couldn't change their nature. So this lion, you can, you, he had a lion, but he trained the lion. But the lion did not change its nature because he still had people. So we see Malachim, they cannot change the animals. As the scripture says, the beasts, the birds, the reptiles, the sea creatures, you cannot, they cannot change. Only man can, has the ability to change. Mankind is created so that his nature can be changed. His character can be built. It can go down or you can build it up. Either way. But I would like you to understand here it says, a man who is determined to follow Yahweh's laws can actually change his nature or the way he determines to walk or live. And I put in your metria.
The word nature is number 79 and it means to wrestle with. And you can remember in the scripture there's a story of a man who wrestled with the Malachim and we were told that it's not physical wrestling, it's sitting under the feet of the priest and learning. And then the word walk is Greek 931 and it means torment, severe pain, torture, vex, agony, a touchstone. And synonyms for the word touchstone is indicator, gauge, benchmark, test. And it's scriptural. We have the test and trials that we go through. Exodus 20, 20 says that. And the word love, live, or the, the way to walk and live. The word live is 734, and it means by extension, the way of life, manner of conduct. And that makes me think of First Timothy 3, 15, about the proper way to conduct yourself in the house of Yahweh. And... In Greek, it's for number 48. It means to purify, ceremonially cleanse. And we know in the first book of Israel, pastor says that when you repent, confess, and you convert, you're cleansing yourself through the teachings from the house of Yahweh. So the only, I would like to tell you that the only reason why the animals were created different, they don't have that nature to change, is it's for the training of the 144,000 priesthood who we are training to be. And so remember, be determined to change because you have that ability within you. And with that, I'll turn to the next step. Shabbat shalom. Please be seated. So when I was younger, I was growing up in small towns, and we had the rule of Head home when the street lights come on so that you're home before dark. Anybody else have similar rules? So did you ever lose track of time down at the creek and when you realize what time it was, you drop everything and you hop on your bike and you ride as fast as you can, maybe even running through a few uh, stop signs, hoping you don't get hit. And then you get home and the house is dark and you find a note that says, working late, see you soon. It's like, man, I just did all that version. Okay, so what about when you expected mom to be working late? Just stayed out a little longer, took your time riding home. <laughs> but then you get to your street and the lights are on. Then you see her car in the drive, You're trying to sneak in the back. And then the dog starts barking, <laughs> busted. <laughs> so the title of my speech today is It's Later Than You Think. So we've been hearing a lot about Passover and coming out of the world preparation, self-examination. So are we going to take this seriously? Are we going to heed the warning? Uh, From dictionary.com, heed is to give careful attention to, and warning is serving to warn, advise, caution. And in the thesaurus, under the heading, notice of possible occurrence, it says advice, guidance, recommendation, look out, and word to the wise. So there's only 153 days left until Passover. (laughs) So the next few weeks are going to just drag on, especially if it's cold. But then we'll all be in feast prep mode, and so these 21 weeks are going to fly. So last Sabbath, pastor turned on the street lights. (laughs) It's time to head home. Uh, It's time to stop skipping rocks down at the creek and ride in circles. In the second book of Israel... Chapter 31, verse 32, if you look into the world today, you see nothing but a rat race all the time. They have the mindset, get, acquire, get, acquire. He who seeks after silver will never be satisfied. And a little further down it says, it's like a dog chasing his tail around and around. He never catches it. So what are we doing? What are we holding on to? Is it family, a job, a pretty house, the new season of that stupid show that's always in your news feed? Uh, still trying to tie up loose ends? Or are you waiting for pastor to call you and be like, hey, did you hear that sermon last Sabbath? Oh, great, yeah, I was talking to you. (laughs) You need to get here. Like, no, like the only reason that we shouldn't be making plans and executing them is if he does call us and say, just hold on a little longer, just wait. (laughs) So uh, I used to say that I would change a particular thing if pastor would call me and tell me to. 
But then one day I realized that he calls me all the time. He calls me when he gets up there. He calls me when I hear him on the radio. Uh, he calls me anytime I open a house yard publication or come to class. So he calls us, but do we answer? Uh, so some might still, like, are we still looking over the fence, like in the grass looks greener over there? Uh, or like my last speech, are we not applying our minds enough and going around stirring up drama and stepping on people's feet? We've got to be here physically doing the work, mentally overcoming the carnal mind, and spiritually engorging ourselves with the fruit of righteousness. So I was just telling someone the other day that a few times when I was at my dad's house, me and my brother, we were outside, and it, it wasn't that late, but it was dark. And so my dad poked his head out the door, slammed the door, turned off the light, and locked it. And it's like, we were locked out of the house. <laughs> we were there, but we weren't doing what was required of us. So Proverbs 8, 33 through 35, says, listen to instruction, follow the rules, okay, and be wise, do not reject it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting by the post of my door. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains honor from Yahweh. Remember, Yahweh is our strength, our comfort, and our provider. So how much will we trust? Are we going to drag our feet and dilly-dally a little longer, thinking mom's not home? <laughs> thinking, <laughs> thinking mom's working late? <laughs> Remember, we can't get in without a garment. Or are we going to rush home to settle in and be ready? Ready means completely prepared or in fit condition for immediate action or use. So back to the second book of Israel, chapter 31, verse 34. It says, uh, Ecclesiastes 12.1, remember your creator in the days of your youth. We read this before, but maybe it will make a little more sense to you now. This man, Solomon, searched after everything and then came to a conclusion. And Yahweh inspired him to write this conclusion for you. What is important, the merry-go-round, the dog chasing his tail, or finally stopping and going to look for food that will nourish your body? Um, so what's important to you? Are we calibrating our focus, doing all we can to be immovable, everlasting pillars in the, uh, Yahweh's house? And of course, finding positive, righteous things to uh, occupy our minds. Remember, Satan's greatest weapon against us is our minds. We can't let her toy with us, and we can't give her any slack, or she'll be uh, slinging us around like a rag doll. Um, instead, we got to chain that beast. We control our actions. We know what we got to do to be ready by Passover. And if you don't, call your counselors. Ask it, Abel. So I'll leave you with a little poem. I would sing it, but <clears throat> I got this uh, little bit of a <laughs> It's called Anticipate Dark Days. So is it the calm before the storm? Are you prepared for this? Sharpen your axe, bundle up. Hard times are coming. Uh, the tree will be shaken, but who will fall? Who will hold fast and respond to the call? As the days drag on, don't become fate. Reach out, fix your clock so you're not late. Because it's two minutes to midnight. Have you made your bed? Bombs dropping, heart stopping. Be ready to meet your king. And with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Please be seated. Why am I here? Why am I here? That, that's a great question. It's a great question, and it's a personal question that if you're honest with yourself, it can be very helpful. So there is purpose to life. Nothing is randomly done. Everything has been strategically set in order. 1 Corinthians 15 and 23 speaks of every man being in his own order. The first one recalled from the dead, afterward those who are messiahs at his coming. So in that, we see a process, a plan that includes 
everyone. So prepare. What does it mean to prepare? To prepare means to make ready for use or consideration. To prepare for anything, you must have a clear understanding of why. Why are you preparing? I'm speaking of the preparation for the Feast of Passover in the city of Israel. The next question is how. How do you prepare? You have to ask yourself the right questions. Let's start with a few statements, and I would like all of you to repeat after me. I matter. I am important. I am valuable in the eyes of Yahweh. Yahweh made me with the ability to reach my full potential. Yes. Now, before you begin to sit up in your chair a little taller and pat yourself on the back, I want you all to know that you are all of those things, but you are not all of those things for yourself. You are all of those things for someone else. Matthew 23 and 11. Matthew, if you have the King James Version. Yahshua said, he who is greatest among you will be your servant. The highest dignity in the house of Yahweh is not rulership, but ministry and service. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing lives for itself. There is a quote that says, nothing in nature lives for itself. Rivers don't drink their own water. Trees don't eat their own fruit. The sun doesn't give heat for itself. Flowers don't spread fragrance for themselves. And living for others is the rule of nature. And therein lies the secret of life. So why am I here? Me. Why am I here? I'm here for you. All of you. That's why I'm here. We are all here for someone else. You matter because someone needs you to stand in your place. As one body, Romans 12, four to five, for as we have many members in one body, all members do not have the same function. So we being many as one body in Messiah, and each one members, one belonging to another. So why are you preparing for Passover in the city of Israel? Because someone else needs you. Yahweh has called us all to be servants. Let us become a righteous vessel, fit for the Father's use, and prepared for every righteous work. He who is greatest among you will be your servant. This, this is a mindset. It's a character. How do you prepare for the Passover in the city of Israel? It's not just about wearing purple linen and gathering together. That's a part of it. It's about obtaining the right mindset. 
That's how you prepare, by obtaining the right mindset. Where the mind goes, the body will follow. Let this mind be in you. In Philippians 2, 5 and 7, let this mind be in you, which was also in Yahshua Messiah, who being in the form of Yahweh did not think it was something to be seized upon, to be equal with Yahweh, but abased himself, taking the form of a servant, made like men being born. Reading the books of Israel, reading the books of Israel helps us understand the servant's heart. The books of Israel is Israel's service to you. That's Israel's service. So what is your service? Someone needs you, and Yahweh gave you what you need to serve them. Use your mind, your talents, your abilities, and your gifts to his honor. Please stand and welcome the next teacher. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Please be seated. The title of my presentation today is Under Yahweh's Shadow Are We Taught? And I want you to be turning over to Matithia 7, verse 24. Now, we've heard a lot today about preparing for the great upcoming Feast of Passover, which is 153 days away, which I almost spaced out when our speaker said that because you know it's going to come like tomorrow. Those days fly by. But when we think of this upcoming Feast of Passover, how, are you, how do we feel? How are you feeling? Are we nervous? Are we excited? Are we terrified? Or are we figuring out what we need to hurry up and rush and do because we thought we had more time? What does it make us feel when we think of this upcoming great feast of Passover? If you're in Matthew 7, verse 24, this is Yeshua, and he says, Therefore, everyone who hears these things, these sayings of mine, and does them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat against that house, but it did not fall, for it was founded upon the rock. What is our faith built on? The speaker before me asked, why am I here? I ask you the same question. Why are you here? What is your purpose? What is our goal? We're in Yahweh's house for a reason. What is your reason? And if you don't know, then don't say, well, I don't know. <laughs> no, figure it out. Search it out. We're in Yahweh's house, but what is Yahweh's house? What does it mean to us? We're in the great city of Israel. What is the city of Israel? It is a city of refuge, and I'm going to get into that. But think about this. All right, so you build your faith on this rock. All right, whenever you move to a new city, what is the first thing you do? You put down roots. How deep are our roots? What are we putting into the work of Yahweh that gives us a reason to stay in Yahweh's house? If you come to, if you come to Yahweh's house and you're just here, I'll be honest with you, it is an extremely boring place. If you just come and you just come to classes and you sit there, you don't come to classes and you just come to services and you sit and you go home. It is, because Yahweh's house is a family. You have to get involved. You have to be a part of the work. You have to study. You have to know the plan of Yahweh. If you don't understand the plan of Yahweh and you don't study, you don't know why you're here. And that's why it's boring. Because Yahweh's plan is, Yahweh has the biggest mystery to ever be unfilled. And every time the great Kahan gets up there and starts talking about, you know, this court in heaven and everything that's going on, you realize that we're like this small in this grand scheme of things that Yahweh has going on. And when we prepare for the great feast of Passover, Keep that in mind and remember that we're not just preparing for a feast of Passover. We're preparing for something much greater. All right now, if you flip over to, I'm just going to quote it. In Psalms 46, verse 1, it says, Yahweh is our refuge and our strength. Now, what does the word refuge mean? Yahweh is our refuge and our strength. That word refuge means a shelter, a protection from danger, 
and a condition of which we are safe. Yahweh is our refuge because we know that under his shadow we will remain safe. Now, if you flip over to Psalms 91, I'm going to be reading verse 1 and 2 and 9. So Psalms 91, verse 1 and 2 and verse 9. It says, Under your shadow, O Yahweh, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We say to you, Yahweh, you are our refuge and our fortress. You are our Father, in you we will trust. And verse 9 says, Because you have made Yahweh your refuge, because you have made the Most High your house, the house of Yahweh, no evil will befall you. How do you make the house of Yahweh your house? You get involved. Anybody who has a family, even if you're a single child, you're in a family, you know that a family has to get involved because there's always countless of things that have to be done. But in the family of Yahweh and the city of Yezreel, we're preparing for the two billion who haven't even came yet. Our family is bigger than any extended family you have ever seen, bigger than any adopted family that you've ever seen. That is what we are preparing for in this city of Yezreel and this city of refuge. Now, in the 14th book of Israel, part 1, chapter 16, the overseer goes in a great detail on what the city of refuge is. In verse 74, he says that the city of refuge is where one goes to await a trial. You're waiting for evidence to be drawn up against you or for you. And we know right now in the city of Israel, that's exactly what we're doing. It's our testing ground. It's where we're sitting here on the sea of glass and our books are being written. That's the evidence that's being presented on us and we're waiting for our judgment. But what is our judgment? What are we doing? Because the pastor has told us many times we are in control of the judgment, whether we are guilty or whether we are found worthy. We are the ones who control this. Now in Isaiah 1, verse 19 through 20, it says that when you go to the house of Yahweh, you will have peace if you do two things. You must be willing and obey. If we are willing to obey the instructions that is given from Yahweh's house. And they're going to ask you, what is your foundation built on? Where is your faith? How deep are your roots? Hey, and on, sorry, in 2 Tamiah 4, verse 7 through 8, 2 Tamiah 4, verse 7 through 8, it says, I have fought a righteous fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. How can we say this with such boldness? I always think of that when I hear, when I read the great Shaul's writings. How can he say this with such boldness? I have fought a righteous fight. Right now, how many of us can say that? Many of us probably can, because I, when I've grown up in the house of Yahweh, there's so many people that I've seen from the time I was small till all the way now. So we're fighting that righteous fight, but don't give up. Because we're coming to the end, and I always think, you can tell that Yahweh is the greatest being, but you can also tell that he's a father. Because every parent knows that if you tell your child you're going to be home at 5 o'clock, and you give them a list of things to do, at four o'clock they start. Because they know it only takes them an hour. That's why Yahweh didn't tell us when he's coming. He just says, be ready. And he gives us all of these things to do, to study, to know, so that you can teach someone else. And if we wait till two weeks before Passover, we're going to miss half of it. Because as an overcoming procrastinator, I can tell you that when you wait till the last minute, you always leave ten things undone. Or you'll get right to where you're supposed to and you're missing that one thing that completes the puzzle. It's never all there. And that is why Yahweh says, be ready. I'm not going to tell you when I'm coming. I'm going to tell you to be there and to be ready. Hey, and continuing on, the city of Yisrael. I sent out a message yesterday because I was thinking of the city of Yisrael. And I was talking to some sisters and I said, what is the city of Yisrael to you? In your own words, when you think of this, because the overseer and the great Gahans have been talking about it for weeks now, but what is this city of Yisrael? Okay, and a city, when you think of a city in general, there's so many things that go into it. And you think of we're going to need not only carpenters, we're going to need therapists, we're going to need people who can help with the elderly, the mentally ill, we're going to need childcare, we're going to need schools, we're going to need all of these things. That makes a city. But the city of Yisrael is so much more than a city. Because if you think of it, how many sanctuary, quote-unquote, cities do we have across America that's supposed to be a safe haven for people to go? But the same leaders rule those cities that rule everything else. And their cities are falling apart, and no one is safe. 
But the city of Israel is ruled by the governing of Yahweh's laws. That's what makes it different. And in the city of Israel, we have to follow these laws strictly so that we have a safe haven. We have a refuge that Yahweh has built. And the one word that stuck out to me when I asked everyone what the city of Israel is to them, they said it's hope. The city of Israel is hope because throughout all eternity, we're going to be able to tell people, I know it feels like you had to wait 20 years. I know it feels like it wasn't worth it at the time. And it feels like it just keeps going and nothing is going your way. But you know, 3,000 years ago when I went through it in the city of Israel when it was first founded, it came. And we're going to be able to be that hope to them to know that Yahweh's word is true and Yahweh's house is the only refuge of safety. And with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Shabbat Shalom, great family of Yahweh, please be seated. Following along with the title for today, be ready for the great Passover and be prepared to enter the city of Israel. Well, I want to ask, I hope by now that you all realize that your invitation for Passover feast was already sent out. How many people already realized that? The seventh Malach Yisrael Hawkins has already blown the trumpet, the silver trumpet in Zion, and sound the alarm on Yahweh's holy mountain. He said, it is time to come home permanently. Now, so what are you dragging your feet? Why are you being delayed? Yahweh say, come home now. Now, following along, I want to take you to Positive Laws 59. It is found in number 10, 2, 9, and 10, and it reads, the silver trumpet must be sounded at the feast time, the new moon, and also in the time of tribulation. In the time of tribulation. It was sounded to call the congregation together. So be you ready? Be you prepared? The title of my speech today is All the Bees Will Be There. If you want to be a bee or a buzzing bee or a busy bee, you will certainly be here. You will be at the, at the Feast of Passover 2020. Please stay tuned to follow in on who will be the rest of the bees. Now, the reason for this invitation that was already given, I want to cover two main points. Why the Passover? And why are the city of Israel? Now, the word Passover is Hebrew word number 6453, and it means festival or victim. It goes to Hebrew word number 6452, which means to dance, to leap, Passover offering. If you look at the same word in Greek, 6452, it goes to 3957, and it means special sacrifice. It also means to spare or to skip over. Now, taken from the book of the deception concerning Yahweh's calendar of event, chapter 2, verse 133 to 136, the disciples of Yahshua knew that the Passover must be prepared for, both physically and spiritually. An internal fitness must be performed. Cleansing oneself from sin, repenting, getting out of all of the yuck and the stuff and the sin that must be pushed aside. It is the only way that Yahweh, we can be able to seek Yahweh asking forgiveness. And through that forgiveness, the sparing of death will pass over us. 
Very recently, our great overseer has told us about the real Passover is very soon. Passing over from death to life. And we can see the same example shown in Exodus 12, 12. And we can read that from the book of, Yah the book of Yahweh. And it reads, it's found on page 54. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and strike down, strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and animal. And I will execute judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am Yahweh. Looking over to verse 24, it says, And you shall observe this as an ordinance, you and your son, forever. Now, the Passover in the days of Moshe was only a shadow of things to come. The real thing that is set for our time period. Just as Isaac was a shadow of Yeshua, the true lamb of Yahweh who came and died, he is now our eternal sacrifice, our great high priest. The shadow of things to come. It is an overcasting of something temporal that will be replaced by what is real and permanent. Another example shown is same as the fiery furnace spoken in Daniel 3 and just covering between 17 to 25. Representing the great, the fiery furnace represented the great cremation the one hour burning that will take place, fixing to wipe out four-fifths of man's population, where sinners will wipe out sinners. We must take note of the fourth being found in that fiery furnace. That fourth being, one being like the son of man, who really is Israel Hawkins, the man clothed in linen, standing in the great nuclear flame safely delivering the house of Yahweh and two billion remnants who will be placed in the great protected place, the city of Israel. Now, for your notes, you can look at Metitia 24, 29. The sun will be darkened. Isaiah 24, 1 through 6. Few men left. Malachi 4, 1 through 2, where it tells us, Behold, the days come that will burn like an oven, and the proud who did wickedly will be burnt up. Now, as Moshe delivered the children of Israel out of the death sentence in Egypt and take them into the wilderness of God worshippers, the land, the promised land, so is Israel Hawkins and Yeshua Messiah will deliver the great house of Yahweh and two billion workers into the protected place. We can see that in Eremia 23, 5 and through 7, it says they will no longer say, the great Yahweh who bring them out of the land of Egypt, but the one who take them into the protected place. Now the city of Israel, Yahweh shows is the only protected place on planet earth. It is where Yahweh placed his name, where he placed his workers, where he placed his government that will soon guide the universe to peace Protection by his 613 laws. Abraham also saw this protected place and he named it as the city that he saw from afar. You can find that in Hebrews, Hebrew 11, 8 through 10. The city with, the city with, with the foundation whose maker and builder is Yahweh. So now let's go back to all the bees that I promise. If you choose to be the busy bee, or the buzzing bee, you are invited. Because it's at the city of Yahweh where the greatest buzzing will be taking place on the planet Earth. All the frequency will be mega charged and super turn up high, running from the lifeline of 613. The Yometria backs up the book of Yahweh, the biblical code, because the great city of the great secret of the promised land is now being shown. This, the city of Israel is the true land flowing with milk and honey. Now that all the laws and prophecies are being told. Moshe promised it, but Israel delivers it. So who is the bees that will be there? 
all who believe without seeing. The beloved, the branch, those who be holding the branch, the bridegroom, the bride, the builders, the butcher, the baker, the whole bunch of cooks, those who make barbecues as well as those who do bun up cues, the bucket fetcher, the broom sweepers, the beekeeper. In essence, who will be there? The whole body of Messiah, those who are blessed of Yahweh, so you better prepare and be here. I turn it over to the next speaker. Shalom, everyone. You can be seated. First Kepha 3.15. But sanctify Yahweh our Father in your hearts, and always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, humbleness and reverence. We, the Yahwehs, are a peculiar people, and it doesn't take long for others to see that we're different. As a child, my classmates knew that I was different. They knew that I had a different religion, but they didn't ask many questions and I didn't offer any extra information. They knew that I kept the feast, and I would tell my teachers that Okay, you know, I'm going to be gone. Can I get my homework ahead? But sometimes my teachers would forget. So halfway through me being gone, they start asking my classmates questions. You know, where's Laura? And they'd be like, oh, it's fine. She's in Texas. She goes there a lot. She'll be back. <laughs> my classmates also knew that I didn't celebrate the holidays or birthdays. I was riding home on the school bus one night almost home, when one of my classmates asked me the question, so why don't you celebrate birthdays? And I looked at him like a deer in the headlights. Why don't I celebrate what? Birthdays. Why don't you celebrate birthdays? And I looked out the window. I was almost home. The bus driver had just turned the last corner, and I willed him to drive faster. <laughs> but it wasn't fast enough, and I knew that I was going to have to give him an answer. So I gave him the only answer that I knew. I looked at him, and I said, because it's God worship. And he, being a God worshiper, looked at me and said, what's wrong with that? <laughs> and I grabbed my backpack and I ran off the bus. <laughs> As a child, I didn't understand why we believed the things that we believed. I knew it was wrong to celebrate birthdays, but I didn't know why, and I certainly couldn't explain it to another human being. I lacked that firm foundation, that scriptural knowledge to support my beliefs. And that's what I needed to work on. Sisters, it's that foundation. It's that foundation of the laws and the prophets that we need to stay in the house of Yahweh, that we need to be a part of the city of Israel. We need to know why we believe the things that we believe and to be firmly grounded in the faith. We need that foundation. In the fourth book of Israel, The Lying and Betrayal in the House of Yahweh, number three, pastor reads in verse 178, Ephesians 2.19, Therefore, now you are no longer strangers. Do you remember who a stranger is? It's one who's unconverted. You are no longer strangers if... You turn to Yahweh and his every word, and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the house of Yahweh, the house of Yahweh or the household of Yahweh. It's one and the same. Verse 20, and are built on what? The foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the teachers and elders. That is how Yahweh builds you to perfection. 
Yeshua Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone, the head of the house of Yahweh. Verse 21, in whom the whole house, being fitly joined together by Yahweh's unity, grows into the holy house of Yahweh. That, sisters, is the only way to salvation. And we are marked as belonging to Yahweh when we keep the feast and the Sabbath days. But we also need to have the knowledge of why we don't celebrate the holidays. The holidays come around every year. But are we reading the booklets or the study guide every year? Satan is very crafty and very subtle. And if we don't bring these things into our remembrance, sin creeps in. These pagan customs, they creep back into our lives and into the lives of our children. And sometimes when I teach the children, I take on that role of my classmate. You know, the one who asked me those why questions? So why do we eat under the sukkah? Why don't you celebrate Thanksgiving? Why don't we hang Christmas lights? Oftentimes, I see myself in them when I was their age. And it is only through the studying of the House of Yahweh material that we're able to answer those questions. Second Tamiya 2.15, study to show yourself approved. It's through these studies and our involvement in the classes that we learn and we strengthen our foundation. I remember the first time I took the advanced speech class. I was a teenager, a young adult, somewhere around that age, and I was petrified because speech number two is prove it with the King James Version. I grew up with the second edition Book of Yahweh. I don't even think I'd ever read the King James Version, much less had to prove it to someone else that I could use it. It was a foreign language to me, and I needed help with that speech. Thankfully, I got that help, and I passed. And it was through that class and the many others that I was strengthened with my understanding of how to use the King James Version and the other material in the House of Yahweh. The classes strengthen our foundation. And it doesn't matter if we're young or old, we all need those classes. First Tamiah 4, 12 through 16, we've heard this scripture today. Let no man despise your youth. And the Apostle Shaul wasn't just speaking to the youth here. But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity until I come. Give attention to the reading, exhortation, to the teachings. In verse 16, pay attention to yourself and to the doctrines. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. 2 Tamiah 3, 13 through 14. But evil men and imposters, they will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But we need to continue in the things that we have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom we have learned them. And we are so blessed, sisters, to have a teacher in these last days who can answer our questions. Yahweh inspires Passover, and we need to hang on to his teachings so we won't be deceived. We need to keep them in remembrance. We're getting ready for Passover, which represents coming out of God worship. And winter can be very long. It's cold, it's dark, and the gods descend. And the pressure is extreme. Satan knows she only has a short time left, and she is trying to wear us out. And it can be very easy to forget why we are here in Yahweh's house. And that is why we need to strengthen our foundation. Pastor said it best in the 12th book of Israel, part 1, chapter 11, verse 65. Satan, Satan inspires people to say negative things, to pull people out. Like three out of four will fall away. It's better for you to get a firm foundation like Yeshua said. The foundation is on the prophets and the apostles. Get your feet stuck in there and your ears. Don't let anything 
enter your ears. Tell them, no, no way. You keep your negative thinking to yourself. I'm on the road to the kingdom. Don't come at me, come at me with that crapola. Second to Maya 2.19. Nevertheless, the foundation of Yahweh stands sure, having this seal. Yahweh knows those who are his, because everyone who reverences the name of Yahweh departs from iniquity. And finally, sisters, we need to strengthen our foundation in Yahweh. Hang on to your calling. Nourish spirit holy. Get rid of sin and get ready for a great Passover. Please stand and welcome the next speaker. Shabbat shalom. Please be seated. One sister said 153 days. It's 21 weeks and five moons. That's coming close. You know how time flies by. I remember our first feast was Pentecost 1996. I wanted to be at Passover so bad, but I didn't make it. That was the Passover that they had all the snow. That was a protection of Yahweh on that feast. What kind of protection will we have? Only Yahweh knows that. I came to Pentecost, but I I almost didn't make it. I had gotten pneumonia. I was very sick, and I thought, I'm going on a stretcher. If I have to get there, I'm going to get there on a stretcher. And I made it to that feast and was baptized in 1996. Will you be here at the next Passover? Ever since that feast, I've come year after year. I've never missed a feast. But people don't always come back. Will we all be there at the next Passover? My title is, It's a Matter of Choice. Do you reject or accept Yahweh's way? Pastors mentioned that word rejected several times. So I went in to study this word a little bit. Reject is Greek number 593 from Thayer's Greek lexicon. It means to disapprove, reject, repudiate. And in the Webster's Dictionary, repudiate means to refuse to accept or be associated with, deny the truth or validity of. And I looked up reject in the Webster's Dictionary, and it means to dismiss as inadequate, inappropriate, or not to one's taste. In other words, you don't take ownership. You don't see value in it. So let's look at the other side, accept. Accept in Strong's Concordance is Greek number 588, and it means to accept gladly, to welcome In the Thayer's Greek lexicon, it means to accept what is offered, to receive into the mind with assent, A-S-S-E-N-T, to approve, to believe. So I had to look up the word assent. In Webster's Dictionary, it means an expression of approval or agreement. It is a matter of choice whether we reject Yahweh's way or we accept it. Now, when you think about accept, it means to rely upon what is written in the Holy Scriptures. We are the only people on the face of the earth today that live by Yahweh's word. We're the only ones that are keeping the feast properly, the Sabbath day properly. This is Yahweh's way. This is how we accept Yahweh's way. Think about it in a household. You have rules in the house. Before you go in, you take your shoes off, right? When a child goes to school, the child agrees to accept the instruction and follow and do the assignment. When a volunteer goes to a work department, she agrees to accept the regulations of the work area and follow them. And then we heard today about the city of Israel. It has rules and regulations that we choose to accept and follow the rules of. Yahweh is doing this with us. We're choosing to accept, to submit, to surrender to Yahweh's way, then we belong to Yahweh. I did my homework, 1074. Think about it. Four people, Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. Four people had Yahweh's way put before them. Three out of four fell away. Three out of four rejected Yahweh's way. Adam and Eve and Cain framed up Satan's way for mankind And it's been pushed for 6 
thousand years. They took out the sacred name. They said, you don't need to keep those old Jewish laws. But one out of four, Abel, chose to live by Yahweh's way. He chose that way. He had lots of influence. He had three people there trying to convince him that he should sin. What made him different? What made Abel different that he could stand up to that pressure? It's all in the choice. Think about your mind. Your mind grows with information and knowledge. You know, we're trying to obtain that right mindset. You have to feed the mind information and knowledge, otherwise it'll die. So the same way with Spirit of Yahweh. It grows with righteousness. We have to feed it righteousness or it will die. The gods had this spirit. Remember they said, he said, why are you angry? Why are you downcast? Can I have my slide, please? The neurologists claim that every time you resist acting on your anger, put anything else in there, you're actually rewiring your brain to be calmer and more loving. Isn't that wonderful to know? It's with our choices. Every choice we make rewires our brain. And we're building it to either accept or reject Yahweh's way. It goes one way or the other. There's nothing in between. So what choices are we making? Abel knew how to make those right choices. He had a love for Yahweh's way. He loved performing the laws of Yahweh. So when we're called to the house of Yahweh, we come with all sorts of different personalities, backgrounds, experiences. And sometimes when we come together in this great family, we rub on one another, we kind of get irritated with one another, we might even get angry, we might even build hatred for one another. I challenge you to pick the person that you least get along with and learn to love her. Learn to love her. If you do that, everything else will be easy after that. Everything else. This is accepting Yahweh's way. Yahweh's plan for mankind was being offered in the beginning, but it was rejected. So eternal life had to be shut off. It had to be cut off from mankind until these last days when Yahweh is offering it again. Did you know that what Christianity teaches today is exactly what Satan taught Cain and Abel and everyone else in the Garden of Evil. It's the same thing. Nothing has changed. So if you are new to the house of Yahweh, even if you're not new, even if you've been here a few years or a hundred years, however long it's been, be determined. Set it in your mind in advance to be here at the Feast of Passover because I can guarantee you Satan is going to do everything in her power to stop you. She will try to build doubt. She will build hatred. She will build that animosity, bearing a grudge, whatever it is. You have to resist her. So if you cut yourself off from Yahweh, rejecting anything in Yahweh's laws, the dress code, the purity, the obedience to the one sent, whatever it is, spirit holy begins to die. Just like in the mind, if you don't feed it knowledge or information, choose carefully what you feed it because there's a lot of bad stuff out there. But if you don't feed the mind, it will die. The more righteousness we feed into our minds, the stronger it gets. This allows us to continue to accept Yahweh's way. As we prepare for Passover, be determined to be the most righteous people on the face of the earth. Set that goal now. We can do it. Can you ever be too righteous? No. There's no limit to righteousness. So rejecting Yahweh's laws leads to sin, and sin is a poison. It is a poison, and as one said, it deteriorates the body, but it is poison to spirit wholly. And it will kill it if you allow it to go into your mind and dwell on it. It starts with a little anger, a little doubt, a little illegal, illegal lust, whatever it can be, but that will lead you to rejecting Yahweh's house. Let's look at Jacob 3. 13 through 18. This is on page 955, Jacob 3, 13 to 18. This is the fruit of righteousness. Who is wise and understanding among you? Who is proving that they accept Yahweh's way, not rejecting it? Let her show it by her righteous conduct, by works done in the meekness, humility. We heard a lot about that today. That comes from wisdom. If you have bitter rivalry and strife in your hearts, conflict, hatred, offensiveness, animosity, 
Do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. This is our carnal mind, sisters. This is what we wrestle with. We have to wrestle with it all the way to the kingdom. For where there is rivalry and strife, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and righteous fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So let's be peacemakers. Let us show Yahweh in the courts of heaven that we accept the rules, the laws, the regulations, the the moral principles that govern Yahweh's way. It's a matter of choice. Let's choose life by righteousness because we have to be here at this next feast. Make every effort to be here and be there with Yahweh in in the great house of Yahweh. Now, if you all please remain seated. Don't stand yet and wait for the next speaker. Then you can give her a warm welcome. I'd like to honor you with a few words of our overseer. Verse 9, how excellent is your great name in all the earth. Now, if you think about it, he offered this to Adam in the Garden of Eden and said, guard and keep it. You've got to guard and keep this way. Well, of course, that's what we're getting ready to do. That's what we're being trained to do, to guard and keep. So, sin never again. Shalom. Please be seated. The title of my speech today is All the Cities of the Gods Will Fall, But the City of Israel Will will Rise. Okay, All the Cities of the Gods Will Fall, But the City of Israel Will Rise. And somebody told me the other day that there's people here that don't believe that we're in the last three and a half years. And that was kind of disappointing to me because I can't believe there's somebody here that would believe that. Because we all sat here together as a family at the community meal at Pentecost, and Pastor sat on that stage at that table, and he, you know how he has his casual conversation where he talks to us, like, you know, it's a lovely family meal, and that's when he told us we're in the last three and a half years. So hearing that, and then coming away to say that we don't, I don't believe we're in the last three and a half years, if you retranslate that, that's calling Pastor a liar. It's because he sat right here and told us, so... You know, if anybody here still believes that, I'm, I'm just pleading, pray to Yahweh and beg him to help your unbelief, okay? Beg him to help your unbelief, because last week, we all sat together again on a weekly Sabbath, and we all witnessed the grand theft of the Syrian oil, okay? We all saw that together. In the United States, the troops, they're, all, they're in there protecting the oil, We can see that hurt, not the oil. We're in that time period right now. There's so many things that are occurring right now just in the news alone that prove that we're in the last three and a half years. You know, the United States has been the bully to the nations for centuries. And so far, you know, there's things that used to occur in the news a ways back, and I'd be like, you know, are you going to sit there and take that, you know, from us? You know, we'd be going around bullying different countries, but it's not like that anymore. We're still trying to bully but they're standing up to us now. They're like, you know, they're not taking, they're not taking it anymore. And they're, they're forming alliances, and we don't scare them anymore, in other words. And when I say we, I mean the United States. I'm not talking about the House of Yahweh. The House of Yahweh is peaceful. Okay, so, and then we were shown again in the news how the Euphrates River. Now, I know there's some of you out there who think geography is boring, but I'm going, I, I insist, I, you know who you are. Geography is very exciting, and you know, I'm, 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 I'm determined to make you like geography. So go home, look at a map of Syria. Because when we were shown during the feast the news of how Syria was divided with, you know, where Turkey had it, where ISIS had it, where the Syrian government had it, for some reason, you know, in our classes, we, we were taught about the river Euphrates, and we know it comes from Turkey, goes through Syria, goes through Iraq. But for some reason, I'm always looking at Iraq thinking, you know, look, but look at what occurred at feast. You know, Pastor has shown us that all the, 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 the oil wealth is along that river Euphrates in Syria. It's smack dab right there in Syria. And I was amazed because I was looking at a map one night during the feast of Syria, and I didn't realize that there was a certain partition. that They have their lines there. 
But they didn't label one of the lines being the River Euphrates, and it wasn't until it was pointed out to us that that dividing line was the River Euphrates. I about fell out of my chair because I couldn't even believe it. It's like, you know, you could be, we could be off. If it wasn't for the house of Yahweh and we were to go according to our own thoughts, we can be off. And you'll be looking in somewhere else when it's over here that we should be looking. So that's, you know, something to think about. And Damascus, who, who, which is the capital of the same country, we're waiting for that because it's we're told that it's going to cease to be a city, okay? Damascus is going to be a cease to be a city, and we're waiting for that. So I'm going to read an excerpt from the prophetic word. I'm just going to show that. This is the prophetic word that I'm reading an excerpt of, and that's the one that's dated 4-5 of this year. And... This was pretty exciting for me because on page nine, it talks about the city of Tyre. And I'm using the city of Tyre to, to, you know, these are excerpts that are from a peaceful solution to building the next temple. And Pastor goes beyond the shadow of a doubt, proving to us and lining it up how everything in the prophecy of Tyre came to pass, just like he said it would. Okay, so on that page nine, it's talking about Tyre. And these are things that we've heard over and over again. It says, in the year 590 B.Y., the prophet Yekezkia spoke to and prophesied against a great city called Tyre. Tyre was nationally comparable to that time to New York City today. Okay, so picture New York City today. Some of you, uh, we heard from somebody that lived there. Praise Yahweh, she's here now. With seaports and island harbors, Tyre readily imported a steady stream of supplies through her sea routes. Tyre was also supplied by land, but if she were to be cut off from supplies by land, she supposedly could easily survive because of her sea lanes, and the walls surrounding this city were thought to be of eternal strength. They were built to protect this thriving city against any and all attacks. This city was impregnable, or so was believed. Okay, so later, you know, later on, Tyre did fall. Yeketskia prophesied of its fall in 590 B.Y., it fell in 332 BY. And one thing that I thought was interesting is if you look up 332 in Strong's, in Greek, it means to bind with an oath or to bind under a great curse. And we know that Yeketskia prophesied against it. So that, I thought that was very interesting because Yahweh declares things through his prophets. He's declared them through his apostles. And in these last days, he's declaring them through his seventh Malik. And we know that Yahweh has the ability, had the ability, he gave his seventh Malik the ability through those sea of glass. You know, one day we'll be shown how that works, but he was able to show those apostles and those prophets what would occur in these last days. So his word is bond, and it doesn't come back to him void. So the example of uh, Tyre's fall in Yeketskia came to pass in great detail. And it was exciting because when we were going over this prophetic word in class, the teacher was... She, to me, she was an exciting teacher. She took us through Yeketskia 26 and Yeketskia 27, and it has a lot of names in there that might not be familiar with us, but she showed us who they are today, and it was just fascinating, and it got me really looking at that. And if you'll turn with me to Yeketskia 6, on page 648, it's Yeketskia chapter 26, verse 13. I found something pretty interesting when I started looking at that, because we have great teachers in the house of Yahweh, and she was very, very inspiring. And I, I, I love the class because I love history and geography, which pretty soon we'll all love history and geography, right? Because the book of Israel, the book of Yahweh, is a huge history and geography book. Okay, so in Yeketskia 26, verse 13, it says, I will put an end to the voice of your songs, and the sounds of your harps will be heard no more. Okay, can I get my first slide, please? Okay, I found this to be very interesting, okay? So I took the wording from Yeketskia, and in the Yematria, I put harps will be heard no more. Okay, so this is talking about Tyre, and it's 1548, 1446, and 241. And if you'll notice that 1548 means to lay waste, and that, we've seen that occur, right? Is Tyre, does Tyre exist today? Go see if you can find it on a map and tell me what country it's in today, Okay. And that, that saying reminded me of something. So if you'll turn with me to another scripture in Revelation. Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18, verse 22, if you'll look at that. 
It's almost, it's similar wording. It says, and the voice of harpers and the musician and of pipers and trumpeters will be heard no more at all in you. Okay, so can I get my next slide, please? Okay, so if you'll notice with this second slide, the three numbers, the one that I chose to focus on, because they all say something, but there's no time to go through them all. It's 1584, and it means the end. Okay, so this is the scripture that's referring to New York City. Okay, so that the whole chapter of um, 18 in Revelation with the fall of Babylon is referring to New York City, and it's t coming, it's titled The End. Okay? Can I get my third slide? The third slide was pretty interesting to me because when you take the wording from Yeketskia and Revelation, they both say we'll be heard no more. There's a 1074 there. And I know y'all are probably like 1074 again, but for me that was exciting because it was the first time 1074 that I've ever gotten out of Gematria. So I was screaming, okay? Because you can try and put whatever you want in there. There's things I'm like, you know, I'm sure that Yahweh is going to, you know, but it, it, you, it doesn't come. It's disappointing. So for me that that was pretty cool. Okay, so I have another picture to show you if I can get my first picture. This is a, this is a diagram of um, an aerial view of New York, and you can find that in the Mark of the Beast on page 135, and what you're seeing there is the borough of Manhattan, and it's separated from New Jersey by the Hudson River, and the boroughs of Bronx in the back under the clouds, and Queens and the East River are on the right, and, you know, this is a massive city, okay? It's still standing, but it won't be because we were, it, one day it's going to fall. It will, because Yahweh prophesied that it will. All right? And one thing that it says on page 134 of Mark of the Beast, it says, one can see it is both a major point, port and a huge city built on a seaside. Okay, so can I get my second picture just to show you that? You can see at the bottom there, it's, you can see the ports where the boats are, and it's describing New York City here. So one thing that I found interesting when I put both of those Eumetrios together and it had that 1074, I was excited, I mean, not only because it was 1074, but, but it's like seeing pastor's tag number there is like Yahweh's stamp showing that his second prophecy will come to pass by the mouth of his witness, just like the first one did with the prophets. Okay, and you can go through Mark of the Beast, chapter 9, and it gives you all the details about New York City. And even Yachanan, who wrote Revelation, who learned from the seventh Malik, he described those, those buildings. You saw those skyscrapers. He described them as mountains. And one thing that it talks about in the same chapter of Revelation, 18, verse 2, when it talks about, um, if you're, you're on the page, so if we just quickly look, about he cried mightily with a loud, loud strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and will become the habitation of demons, and is the hold of every foul and unclean and hateful, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And we're told in the mark of that beast that that means to raise up sin. But the difference between New York City or any city of the gods and the city of Israel is that we're going to raise up righteousness. So just keep that in mind. They raise up sin, we raise up righteousness. And if you remember, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what a mustard seed looks like. It's very tiny, and we're small right now, but we're going to grow so huge that we're going to engulf the whole universe. So with that, it was a pleasure talking to you, and if you please stand, I'd like to turn it over to our next teacher. Shabbat shalom. Please be seated. The, uh, the peace of Yah be with each and every one of you on this great Sabbath day. I'd like to bring to your remembrance if you ever saw new parents or if you remember the time when you were a new parent. If you watch them closely, they get so excited for nine months, right? They buy everything. Everything is BPA-free. Everything is organic. Everything has to be worth the quality and they go overboard with the cribs, with the stroller, the, the, the car seat. I mean, it's, it racks up a big bill. But what they forget is how to prepare mentally. Because after that cute baby comes, it's 12 a.m., the baby cries. 12.30 a.m., the baby cries. Now the baby's fed. Now the baby needs a change of diaper at 2 a.m. And then maybe your eyes start closing at 3 
And all that becomes a toll. Like, it's just like, oh, why so much? Now you got to worry about the baby. No, nobody sneezes on the baby because I don't have money to buy supplements right now. We got to buy the diapers, right? And then also what, what occurs? A, a new parent, or if you've ever seen parents, they come to the realization the baby can't talk. The baby can't communicate. And you got to read the baby. You got to understand the baby. But even though you go through all these hurdles, having this wonderful baby, you love this baby and you set a time. You set your me time and you just set it aside and you focus on this child. You endure the tough times. And when you learn to master parenting, baby number two comes along. And baby number two is nothing, nothing like baby number one. I'm sure all your parents are like nodding like, yes, it's true. And if you ever watch parents with two children, you're like, ooh, that is like a handful now, a really big handful. But the reason why I give you this analogy, because we see it every day, um, the reason why I give you this analogy, because it's similar to us preparing ourselves to come here. We get excited. We're like, yeah, this is really the place to be. And we get all our physical things ready to move on down and to stay here. But then we never really understand the mentality of making ourselves home here. And I'm not talking about just those who are out there and haven't come home yet. I'm talking about to us too, here. Because there will come a time, and let me emphasize this, there, w- there will come a time when there is no more coming and going. You understand that? We are coming and staying. So that applies to us here too. We are here, and we are staying, okay? So what mentality um, of our brains uh, hinders us from taking this action to make sure we get here, we are ready to get here for the great Passover, and preparing for this great city of Israel, and staying? What is it? And I was thinking, you know, I have to say this in question form, because before we get here, and I've been in that position before, before I get here, I'm saying to myself, where am I going to stay? How am I going to get food to eat? Can I find a job that has great pay? Where am I going to spend my leisure time? Um, You heard the speakers before. Abilene, Texas. I came from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And our zoo, you can walk miles. And when I heard that Abilene had a little tiny zoo, I was like, what place is this? I mean, it was a big transformation. And so these things are going through your mind. I mean, how am I going to live my life down there? So that's really the first thing that our minds go through mentally that kind of hinders us back. We're always concerned about ourselves and how comfortable are we going to be down there. The second thing is you're just not content. Really, we are a spoiled generation. We're just not content. Nothing, I mean, having, you know, 20 dresses in the closet Having your fridge full to where everything is rotting is still not enough. I got to do another personal shopping. I mean, we're just, we're just not content. We're not a content generation. So you're asking, you now you tell yourself, you stop asking the question, and you tell yourself, well, I don't like my dwelling. Because every time it's cold and it's below zero, here in Texas, it feels like it's below zero. I feel the air coming right through my walls. So you're not content with your dwelling. And then you don't like the type of food. I'm Asian, okay? So I like my Asian food. And there's only one Oriental store here in Abilene, Texas. So I understand. I understand where you're going to starve. No. You're, gonna be, you, you, you're not content. I'm not content, right? You have no money. The luxurious life of living in a big city. You got a job. You got money. You can pay for gas and go on your way and do whatever you want to do. Again, you're not content because this lifestyle is going to be different. And you heard many speakers said, I'm bored. I'm bored. This little zoo, this little mall, you call this a mall? Yes, those are my exact words. <laughs> because it was a total life-changing event. But now I want to tell you the real, real situation. We know Revelation 18. We just heard about it. Revelation 18, chapter, four, uh, chapter 18, verses 4, verses 8, Verses 11, verses 17. Come out of her. She's going to suffer plagues and burn. No one will buy her merchants. This is speaking of the world. This is speaking of 
this world that Yahweh is trying to call you out from, the Vatican, all of their system is going to burn in one hour. Their riches will come to nothing, and everything you see that makes money is going to go down. So you know what that means? Let me give you a little reality hit. No more Walmart. No more Sam's Club. No more grocery stores. No more dealers. No more Macy's. Even online. No, no more. There'll be no more gas stations. There'll be no McDonald's. No Burger Kings. No fast food. No Starbucks. There'll be no more amusement parks. There'll be no more cell phone service. I don't, I don't, well, I see somebody going, because she's the one that every time somebody texts, she's like, oh, oh, <laughs> cell phone service. There'll be no more cell phone services, and there'll be no, believe it or not, no money. I'm waiting for that day. I am so tired of counting coins. But no more money. So all of this you worked for, oh, I can't come yet because Yeshua, right, Yeshua said, come and follow me. No, I can't come yet. I got to get myself a job. I worked so hard. I got all this money built up. And, you know, I still owe such and such. And this job will only give me enough money to pay for this. And no more money, people. And nowhere else to spend that money. So where are you going to go? I hope you, I hope you, I hope you were wise and bought a lot of gas to put in your car to come here. Because this is going to be the only city. Because Yahweh's eyes, ears, and heart is here. Yahweh is about his house. So I want to spend the rest of this this speech here to tell you what mentality should we have. Number one, we should trust in Yahweh. You hear it all the time from your counselors. You're like, yeah, you always say that. Trust in Yahweh because Yahweh will provide. And he provides it. Through Yezra Hawkins' brilliant mind of setting up the cafeteria, setting up all the restaurants. I mean, I think we outdid McDonald's sometimes with the type of the recipes that comes out and all the fast food stuff that we make ourselves that's clean. Yahweh has provided so many people here with great talents. You find one person doing a thousand jobs. You're like, oh, you do that too? Oh, you do that too? Yahweh handpicked these wonderful, brilliant people to come. And attention to all you Walmart shoppers, I am sure that when this city grows, and I remember our great head judge over here, I remember the first time she said it in one of her law class, we're going to have a Yamart. We are. We're going to have that one day. So all you Walmart shoppers, you'll be welcome to come to Yamart. <laughs> but the reason we must trust Yahweh and Yahweh will provide is because we have to remember, we are Yahweh to each other. Yahweh is not going to come down and serve you a platter of your most loved stir fry and Asian chicken. No, he's not. He's not. But we are. We are Yahweh to each other. Let Yahweh inspire us to follow that righteous way to serve one another so all of our needs be met. Yahweh cannot inspire a selfish person. And if you're telling yourself, I'm not a selfish person, then that means you are a selfish person if you're telling yourself that. Okay? You need to fulfill your service. You have to do your job because someone is dependent on you. You know how many times I'm like, oh, no one understands. And all of a sudden somebody comes knocking on the door and they take care of it. I'm like, how did they know I needed that? It's because they, oh, sorry, were not selfish. They were not selfish and they allowed Yahweh to inspire them to continue in the work and do their job. Second, second thing we have to mentality, our mentality have to be is be content. If you read in 1 Tamiah 6, the first thing it says is be content. Be content. You got food. You got clothing. What more do you want? We're not in the cities of the 10 cities that have absolutely nothing where our stuff are still being stolen from the cops. No. We are here. We're clothed and we're fed spiritually and, and, and physically. If you remember, one of the great Kohanas came up here and did the Yamatria. And it stuck to me. She said that the Yamatria shows that Pastor Richard Hawkins, our greatest example, was content. He still is content with his job. He has so many mouths to feed. I mean, look at all of us and look how big we are. He has so many mouths to feed and so many people to take care of. But he is so content with it. He could have went to New York, could have got a bigger congregation, could have got a prettier sanctuary. 
But no, he's stuck here in this second dust bowl at times um, to take care of us. Think of that example. Now, this final instruction, and I want you to turn with me to 2 Tamiya, if you can turn fast. 2 Tamiya, chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. The final instruction, this is uh, the Apostle Shavuot talking to Tamiya. So think of this final instruction as pastor giving us this final instruction that you heard. Be ready for the great Passover. Prepare to come to the great city of Israel. And make yourself real, okay, in this verse. It says, be diligent to come to me quickly. Now, I was like, oh, these are names of his people. But listen, put your names there, okay? For Damas has, this is D, Damas is a one of his disciples, one of the apostles, Shaul's disciple, has forsaken me, having loved the present world. You see that? He's no longer with me because he loved the present world. Verse 11. Only Luke is with me, and take Yakana Mark and bring him with you, for he is valuable to me in the ministry. Where do you want to fit your name? That's, that, that's how real it is to us. I'm like, because sometimes I don't know who these people are, but why was it written in the book of Yahweh? I'm like, because I could fit my name in any one of these. Where do you want your name? Do you not want it to be told in the book of Yahweh, in your book, that bring her, bring him, bring that child, because they are valuable to my ministry, and they have stuck with me. And that was the Apostle Shavuot's last instruction, final instruction. And now Ezra Hawkins has given us this final instruction. Take this instruction very serious. And praise Father Yah, Ezra Hawkins knows that we are so slow. That's why he has to keep on telling us, will you get over here? Will you hurry up and come? So take it on and heed to the warning and be his apostle, his disciples that stuck with him. Praise God. If you all please stand. Shabbat shalom again, great saints. You may be, please be seated. I'd like to enter to my portion. I'm your last speaker. A second part of my last speech, part two, the sound effects of the last trumpeter, sound effects of the last trumpet. And we said that the words trumpeter and trumpet were used interchangeably. The sound, something about the sound effect and getting ready for the day, I'm getting ready for the resurrection. Something about the sound of the trumpet. Something about the power, the authority in the voice of the last trumpeter is going to raise the dead. Are we ready? The great one sent in review part one, he said there's something about the sound of the trumpet. And we even heard, we heard the sound of the trumpet. So today, I want to ask you, what is it in our voices what is the effect that has to be in each person's voice, those of us who are resurrecting the dead, to raise the dead and not just resurrect the dead, all the other powerful things that Yahshua did on earth. Two friends gave me some scriptures to put as my resource. They said, um, use uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 40 verses 3 and 6 talking about the sound or the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. And somebody else, another friend gave me 1 Thessalonians uh, 4.16, talking about the resurrection. Are we ready? The great one sent said, 20th of Jacob, he talked about the resurrection and raising the dead. He said, in resurrecting the dead with the use of the subconscious mind, we will get evidence about them. We'll find evidence, and then we will be able to send the evidence here and there to resurrect them. 
What is it that's going to be in our persons? How must we become to be able to do those acts of power and to be ready? Righteousness. But today I want to term righteousness as atonement, atonement with Yahweh. I want to use righteousness as being at one with Yahweh. Because we know Yahshua was at one with Yahweh. He said, I and my father are one. Us too, the great one sent said to us, we must learn how to make ourselves as atonement for others. You remember he's always said that? Especially around the Feast of Atonement. Become atonement for others. We must become atonement for others, hence showing them how to become atonement as well. Can you become an at one man atonement? Can you become an at one man with Yahweh for me? Can I become an at one man atonement with Yahweh for you? Who's going to be an at one man atonement with Yahweh for you? Who's going to be at one with Yahweh for me? Genesis 1.26 says, the authority has to be within us, each person. So, are we going to use, the great one said, said uh, Yahakob 20 during the Feast of Tabernacles. Talking about the resurrection again. It's the use of the subconscious mind. Our atonement with Yahweh, our one meant with Yahweh, is what is going to activate the use of our subconscious minds. Do you agree, Great House? It is me being at one with Yahweh, or each of us being at one with Yahweh, that's going to activate the use of our subconscious minds. Do you agree? It is our at one meant with Yahweh that's going to express Raise the frequency of the Y-A-H-W-E-H that's on our DNA. It is our one meant with Yahweh, our atonement, at one meant, atonement, you see how it's spelled, at one meant, with Yahweh, that's going to express, raise the frequency of the y a h w e E-H, that's on our DNAs. We heard all about it during the feast. It is our at one meant with Yahweh. Each of us being one with Yahweh. Closer to Yahweh. Walking like Yahweh. Decisions making like Yahweh. It is our at one meant with Yahweh. That is going to allow us all the things that, all the things with which the earth creeps, all the works of Yahweh's hands, they will obey us speedily and with a nice attitude. Like Yeshua. He be not one with Yahweh when he said, Lazarus raised. Um, microorganisms were quick to obey him. Our at one moment with Yahweh will do the same thing. You being at one with Yahweh, me being at one with Yahweh, taught to us by the great one sent. The use of the subconscious mind. Is it with science we are going to raise the dead? Is it with all the fancy scientific research we are going to say, okay, this dead, what do they need here? Um, how to put them back together? Is it with science? You remember, can, can science raise the dead? Hasn't the overseer, the great one, sent told us many times, if they could raise the dead, you'd see all their mothers, all their nice friends, their politicians, their doctors. They'd have raised them all already. Science is not able to raise the dead. Can science give life? The closest science has come to giving life is the clone. You remember the cloning of the sheep? 
Please, can we have a short video just to refresh our memory, please? Dolly the sheep was a sensation when she first appeared before the world. A scientific breakthrough, fascinating, but also menacing. Dolly was cloned by taking a body cell from sheep A, fusing that cell's DNA with an egg cell with its nucleus removed from sheep B. This fused cell developed into an embryo, which was placed in the uterus of a surrogate mother, sheep C. The resulting lamb, in this case Dolly, is a clone of sheep A. These were Dolly's so-called siblings, identical sisters, all cloned from the same sheep. Professor Kevin Sinclair worked with them and knew Dolly. It was a step change in our understanding of um, early development. This was Dolly's greatest legacy, advances in what we call stem cell research. The ultimate but still elusive goal is to use cloning technology to create healthy tissues which can be transplanted to heal damaged cells and organs. But back in 1997, Dolly seemed to raise more frightening issues. If we can clone a sheep, many asked, why not a human being? Since then, scientists have cloned more than 20 species, including horses and household pets. But scientists have also recoiled from using these technologies on humans. I think where we draw the line is if we're going to use genetic manipulations, we have to be extremely careful and we have to look for severe disease effects um, to control for. Because with a lot of these things, it's not just the person you're you're, you're doing a genetic manipulation on or potentially cloning, but it would affect all the generations ahead. So Dolly's brave new world has not quite turned out as predicted. A sheep created like none before her, but she could not escape her own mortality. She died in 2003, now stuffed in a Scottish museum. Barnaby Phillips, Al Jazeera, London. Did you hear two things he said? He said it's not just that the sheep or the person that you're doing the genetic makeup with, or it's the generations to come. So I thought of Yahweh and the Great One Saint. What did the Great One Saint say last Sabbath? He said, the Garden of Eden, rather, the Garden of Genes. And I said, think of what Great Father Yahweh, can you compare the mind of Yahweh? Who can know the thoughts of Yahweh and what Yahweh could be doing in the Garden of Eden, the garden of genes, creating, cultivating, he said, Abraham, to bring forth Yahshua, to bring forth us, the great one sent. And I'm thinking, great father Yahweh, can you imagine his mind? We have no words to express the mind of great father Yahweh. Do you agree, great house? See then as well. The amount of ability that Yahweh has given mankind. Nice wisdom. Knowledge, in essence, really, knowledge. That he's, he has given them, he has allowed them, without the use of the subconscious mind. Then see, compare that to what power he's going to give us. Those of us who are choosing his way, who are choosing to become at one with Yahweh, and who will be like Yahweh himself. Praise Yah, and with that I will turn over to the great priests of the house of Yahweh.